Hey everybody, this is Ryan, aka Rainforest, host of The Shakedown. Just a little quick note about this episode. Um, it got real crazy real fast. And uh, if, like, even before the episode started recording, it got a little crazy and a little tense. And honestly, you'll see even from the beginning, I just want to talk about prison transportation. But we didn't talk about that. We actually talked about some other things. We ended up hopefully wrapping into a really good prison transportation story. But in the middle, we got a little bit of a surprise and some other good stuff. So I'm just going gonna, gonna to leave that as a little bit of a cliffhanger, a little uh, a teaser, if you will. But since I've got your attention right now, there's been something else I've been really wanting to talk to you about. So I am about to finish up um, writing and drawing a restorative justice graphic novel. That should be finishing up this month and it should be available soon. And then I would, and then I will let everyone know as soon as it's ready, I'll start having posts of panels and everything on my Instagram, maybe put some on the shakedowns, Instagram and everything. So look look out for it um the other thing is is that we are going to start something um probably like a patreon where you can see those little moments where we're trying to set up and um maybe get in on that action and see the kind of craziness that gets involved if that's something you're interested in if you want or if you want more features, if you want to get more in-depth talk epics, we are going to set that up because, honestly, I want to do this full-time. I want to um, education and outreach full-time is what I want to do and how I want to help people. So if we're going to be able to do that, we want to find ways that help you and show, and we want you to tell us how we can do that. So that is coming soon. And if you have ideas on what we can do and what you would be willing to pay for, aside from just a cool shakedown hoodie or t-shirt, which you can get right now, um, then please let us know on our YouTube comments, on our Instagram comments, on Facebook, Facebook comments. It's at Get the Shakedown. You can find us on all of the places. Um, so definitely look for us there. I'm also at Lorax4, the number four life on Instagram. So yeah, find me. Um, oh yeah, that's another thing about this episode that you're about to watch. Enjoy the episode. But part of the reason the episode is the way it is and why you're getting this early warning, there was a connection issue. And we didn't realize until three quarters of the way in that Malone and Dave could not see me. And, or at some points hear me. So um, if you're wondering why we're interrupting each other constantly, it's because of that reason. So, but like I said, there's some really good stories in there and it's worth it. So stick around. I hope you enjoy it. If you don't let me know, if you do also let me know. Um, and we hope to have some more good stuff coming soon. So thank you so much. Hello and welcome to The Shakedown. This is the podcast where we explain the criminal justice system for those who don't know about it and also make it more relatable to everyone through stories and our personal experiences in dealing with the criminal justice system. And we have a lot of personal experience between the three of us dealing with the criminal justice system. Um, especially in the state of Texas in dealing with Texas prisons. And uh, today we are talking about the transportation inside of Texas prisons, how it works, what it looks like, and personal stories from, uh, from our dealings with being transported inside of Texas prisons. Uh, 
Dave was actually the one who um who he he's the one who inspired this episode because he talked about it um about transportation and kind of the issues with transportation in TDCJ. And um there's honestly there's a ton we can talk about. And I will um I wanted to ask Dave what what are Dave, what are your thoughts? What why did you want to talk about um transportation in Texas prisons? Because I think it's some of it is pointless, I feel like. It's uh, it's and it's really kind of cruel and unusual. I mean they put you on a bus and handcuff you to somebody else. You're packed in like sardines. There's no air conditioning. And sometimes you I mean, I went from Huntsville all the way to the, the panhandle of Texas. That's a long drive. And so when you stop at a unit overnight, they put you in a transit cell with, if you have a mattress, is probably so tore up as just a bunch of lumps. So you end up sleeping on concrete. And it takes like, it took three days to make this trip to the panhandle. And so you get up and they wake you up really early in the morning before the sun, like at three o'clock in the morning, you go sit and you wait and pack you know, they have all your stuff packed up in a bag. Uh, if you have too much stuff, some of your stuff follows you and that could take months. And you what go on about your way. What constitutes too much stuff? Craft shop. They don't take that with you. I mean, what are you allowed to take and what are you not allowed to take? You're getting transferred from another unit. Everything you own is going with you. But what are you allowed to take on the bus with you specifically? Oh, it's one chain bag. One. What's a chain bag? Chain bag is a little bitty bag that is... You, it's like an onion sack. Or yeah, pretty much. It's an onion sack. It's a red onion sack. And it's one of those. Not it's two, not tall, three. Oh, I take it back. Yeah. It could be two if you have legal work. What do you think on that, average is the number of oh. uh, onion sacks worth of stuff that uh, most inmates possess? I mean, you can't even put you couldn't even put seventy five dollars of commissary in one onion bag. You couldn't put I don't know, you could put what, probably three cases of soups. I didn't you, but here's the well, thing. Well one thing could, yeah. I was gonna say I think everybody, one thing that more will well, go ahead. I can say that just about everybody listening probably knows what a what a uh, how big a package of ramen noodles is. Right. So imagine and how big, a, you know, and there's what 24 of those in a case. So you could fit three cases of ramen noodles in a red bag, red chain bag. And that's being very generous. What kind of uh, property does uh, do inmates Catch. generally have in Texas prisons? I mean, other than commissary, do they, you know, do they have a is there anything else that they would carry with them? Oh, pictures, letters, uh, so, books, so. laundry. I mean, Laundry. shoes. Yeah, you know, uh, this is you IG can be albums. transported at any time. So this is people get transported after years. I, the first, the after I got initial. So the when I got moved around, I got moved around one after county jail, and then after county jail, I got moved. Uh, I spent six months in a transfer facility. Then got moved, uh, then got spent a week down in, I can't remember what that, that thing is in Huntsville, the wall, right next to the walls unit where you get classified or whatever. And then it's a week there. And then you oh, get God, moved God. all the way across Texas. What's that? Yeah. So, but it's, there's the thing. So the, uh, when I get moved across Texas, so they, Supposedly, when you hit one of these, the diagnostics units, like, you know, the transfer units, it's for processing. You're being processed in, right? And so I hit this unit, and I was there. About like, you know, I think I was there for four days, and I did, didn't do all of the processing, and then I get moved to another unit to go to do more processing. You know, it's like, so why are you starting them at processing in one unit? And finishing them up on another, that doesn't really make any sense. You know, so, and it's, right. it's a numbers TDC. If you have people coming in, that means people have to go out. Even if it's full, the only way you're going to be able to allow more inmates into the unit is if they're going to be inmates getting out. I mean, think about it. If you put water in a glass full of water and if you put more water in, some water's going in, the rest of the water's going out. 
So it's common sense, right? Right. So but the the other part is yeah. is that yeah. They had a but the reason I got moved out of Dalhart after like three years was because Hurricane Harvey hit the coast of Texas. Everyone got moved around and they moved me from the top like thirty miles south of Oklahoma down to Houston. And oh, wow. all in that area. So you were in a part of Texas where there are no hurricanes yeah, whatsoever. But right. the inmate, but the guys that were down there, I was a part of the guys that got uh, that got evacuated due to Harvey, and they sent us to the pack unit, which was under a lawsuit for air conditioning, and the judge had had uh, got really upset because there wasn't any supposed, anybody supposed to be going to that unit. Because of the because of the lawsuit, so he he got in his feelings, thinking that his authority had been taken from him. So now he decided that everyone that had been shipped to the pack unit now is also under the same lawsuit as the inmates that were there before that, and had to be air conditioned. So they couldn't send us back to the unit that we came from because it didn't have air conditioning. Now they had to send us to units that had air conditioning, and so that's why. They had to do the big shuffle. That's that. That's why all of you guys ended up over there on the Stringfellow unit. Uh, guys like uh, 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 a lot of our friends that that we ended up making uh, after that were sent, were directly sent there because uh, the inmates that were on the Stringfellow unit had to go to their unit because they were they were on either uh, transfer units, transfer facilities that had air conditioning. No, I, I get this. I get. I understand that. So you're talking about a valid reason why people should get moved from why people are getting moved around. What I'm talking about is the completely inane dumbass reasons why they're just moving people from one unit to another. I'm and, just, and I, they I'm do just in awe of how it all worked out that way. That I mean, that strange confluence of events made it to where we all are sitting here right now today. Having okay. This conversation. All right. Well, that's, I mean, that's great, but it's like, I know that's not what we're talking about, but no, it but it struck me. It is, and it is kind of interesting the way that all worked out. But my point is, is they move people around for no good reason. You know, they take people that are like, they enter the system four days into being at intake unit. I'm getting moved to another intake unit. And that's not just me. It's a bunch of other people that are, that they're doing the same thing to you. And and that's, they, they do like, honestly, you they have your charge before you get in before you get to prison they know what your charge is they have all of your information they have your criminal history they have all of it so technically if they wanted to send you to one prison with like based on that information they could they could just send you to the prison whichever one they know where you lived in texas they could they could base it all around the information before you go to prison but instead they do this weird thing yeah, where I remember why. when I was I mean, at Gurney, which is the unit. They have some kind of security issue on one unit and they'll, and the way that they handle a lot of those type of things, if they have a ride on a unit or if they have a security issue, or if the inmates all decide that they're going to do a, uh, a, 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 a work strike and they're not going to work until they get something, hand, so, some issue taken care of. TDC's way of handling that, is to scatter those people to the four corners of Texas and then replace everybody on that unit with some with brand new people that they can start over with. That way they can, that's one of the ways that they fight inmate unity. It makes that, perfect that sense. Is one, that of, is one thing, but they even. Know, people trying to control inmates and keep them, you know, passive and compliant or, or you know, doing what they're told. But but even before it gets to that point, Malone, yeah, when lost Ryan, at the transfer man. facility, there's no there's no reason to have a Ryan transfer video. facility because you know what Ryan was a boring person. Oh, well, it's it's <laughs> cutting in and out that. right now because of the connection. But can you hear me? Thinking about kicking Ryan to the curb for a long time now. But wasn't for the fact that he does all the editing, blah blah blah, and all the legwork and stuff like that. That Dave and I are far too cool to do. Well. I don't have enough time. I work two jobs. Exactly. Who I don't else? have a lot who of time. Has time to do all that nerd stuff. Nerds. That's who has that time. You have a lot more time than I do. Oh, I don't. What makes you think I have time? 
Uh, what time did you get off work today? Uh, I don't know, 3.30. What time right. did I go to work is the question. doesn't matter. What time did you go to work? I got to work at 10.30. Yeah, three. I didn't even, I was at work for four hours by the time you got to work. How many hours do you, I mean, how, you know, I work two jobs. I don't know if you realize this or not. How many times have you told me, hey, you need to work a little less so we can do something? I'm just trying to make you feel better about being. <laughs> oh, I hate you. I don't, really. I don't. <laughs> Sometimes you frustrate me to know I know. Really? Yeah, but that's part of your charm. <laughs> oh, so I'm trying to. I'm, yeah. I'm frustrated. <laughs> Please I'm tell to, me about okay. it. I frustrate people to no end as well. You do? Not me. Never? Yeah. No. No? No, not at all. That's because you spent so much time in prison. You know, you're you used to right. you're used to assholes. Oh, man, I can I can deal with an asshole. <laughs> I can handle an asshole. I know my way around an asshole. <laughs> you th- I'm sure you do. I mean, you've seen a lot of them in the shower. Did you inspect any? You're just yours. When well, you're at, not just yours. When I, you were, I tell that to all the girls in prison. Now. Did you when you were at Darrington? Did you <laughs> did you spend a lot of time in that one corner of the shower? There's a corner in the shower in Darrington. Mm. At least when I was there, there was an area where all the all the uh, people that like to dabble in other men used to hang out in. Really? Well, they didn't have all that when I was there. Did you have to use building showers, or did you go with work? I, 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 was, I was there for six years. I think. Well, it yeah. depends on like what era of time you're talking about. I hated having to come in from the fields. And... I seen this guy in the fields. This this coming in from the fields. There's this one black dude. Right, he's like rail thin. He's butt ass naked, except he's wearing a pair of TDC bro pants with the laces taken out in the shower. Right, he's like standing in the shower with his TDC bro pants on. Probably smart to have his shoes on. Yeah, I mean, he's cleaning his boots along with himself, right? right. I mean, that's, that's a lot of the guys do that. But he's over there standing in the shower talking sh- cash shit to this one guard, right? And he's got the right guard, dude. He's got the the hothead of the, of, of the field force. This one guy that just thinks he's big shit. The dude that he's talking shit to is the size of a linebacker. It's a really big guy, right? His name was Evans. And Evans... Had already had. I mean, he he already had a reputation for, going, for taking swings at people, right? I mean, he was he he wasn't uh, uh, going to sit there and take a lot of verbal abuse from anybody. He 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 will uh, physically fight back. And so this guy, this scrawny string bean, is standing there in the shower, just going the hell off, telling this dude, "Yeah, you don't want to fuck with me. I'm telling you right now, I'm a knockout artist. I will kick your fucking ass." He's just going, just telling, just telling Evans off to the point where Evans like. He looks at the guard. He looks at the other field law next to him. Takes his cowboy hat off. Says, I have shit, and throws it down on that on that little cattle. <laughs> yep. And comes storming into the shower. Takes his rail. I mean, reaches back and takes this big old haymaker swing at at this at the skinny guy. The skinny guy ducks it, <laughs> ducks the punch, reaches down, grabs Evans by his by his pant legs and dumps his ass in the water, <laughs> climbs on top of him, butt ass naked now, you know, right? He's standing over Evans, ass naked, you know, everything dangling down in Evans' face, just throwing punch after punch after punch, just pow, pow, pow. All the other guards were like, oh my God, had to run in there and save Evans' ass. Evans looked like that. That was just amazing. That's awesome. That was awesome. That poor guy <laughs> was absolutely 100% in the right and was defending himself and got a assault on an officer charge and got more time for that and spent quite a bit more time in prison. You will never beat one of those charges when you have to go to a... Go to a uh, this is all rigged anyway. I mean, you're going to a jury of in a court of their peers um, that is 110 percent on the side of the guard no matter what i mean your staff counsel your major case lawyer oh, I'm not even the, the, but i mean even them they, they're fucking paid by tdc that's even worse you had captain knox back in those days was the disciplinary captain i remember him captain knox his tagline his when you walk in the door he would tell you, I've never found an inmate 
not guilty. I've never found an inmate innocent in a single case ever in the 10 years that I have been uh, 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 running these cases. I mean, he's letting you know, right? and I'm not about to, ever, is what he was telling you. Explain your case to him, and he reaches over there, and he'd hit that on that old-fashioned-ass tape, or that cassette recorder. And, and stop it. There and stop it, and then go the fuck off on you. And get you all kinds of ways riled up. I'm talking about cut, cut, just go, just tell you what a pussy you are and how he's going to fuck you over and everything doesn't give a damn about anything that you have to say, blah, blah, blah. And then reach back over there and hit record again. And just to catch you all angry and frustrated and not being able to present your case. It's a real, real crime show. Yeah, he real. can still hear and see us. We just can't see him or hear him. Well, okay. I will officially start my story about uh, my my uh, her har- harrowing adventures in transportation and TDC. As a young man, probably before the age of twenty, somewhere around eighteen or nineteen. You ever had a shit on a, on a train bus? Thank God, I have not. That was always my biggest fear. And I've always kind of thought about, but you know, I was so raised and I was raised in prison. I've been able, you know, I have very good control over my bottles. You know, I mean, it's just kind of been ingrained. But that's you really threw me off my game there. So <laughs> I'm going to do this to do that the whole story, guys. We were, uh, <laughs> we we were. About to leave uh, the walls unit. I'm, I'm glad that they can see your hands because usually your hands are trying to be in my lap, and that's not cool. What does that got to do with anything? We're free to be gay. If we want to. I mean, I have bars on my door. We're I free could, to I sit could, there and and have our hands in each other's laps. I could lock you in. I have to have a key to let you out. Lock me into what? It's kind of like prison. Lock me into in, in a relationship with you. Nina is waiting for you in a sex cell. I'm kind of really, I'm really miss Nina. I, I feel bad that we had to uh, exclude her. So, so Ryan wants to wrap. We're after taking, the store, so let's just. Oh, we're right. taking off from Huntsville, and I, I almost got. Uh, as y'all know, there's generally two uh, different sections in a lot of these big chain buses. When you're taking a long trip, you're going to be on one of these really big buses. They, uh, as you said, you know the uh, the guys that are in uh, population are going to get handcuffed. To get, there's going to be. Uh, you're going to get handcuffed together to another inmate. And uh, it's going to be at random. You're going to be handcuffed to some random stranger who's going to be sitting next to you on the bus. But if you're in SEG, if you're an a, uh, a, uh, inmate that's in uh, administrative segregation for some kind of disciplinary, disciplinary action or some kind of safekeeping si- uh, situation, uh, uh, what do they call that? Protective, uh, protective, protective custody. Protective custody, something like that. Then they're going to put you in uh, a, a a part of the bus that's in the front of the bus where you're not going to be handcuffed to anyone else. You're instead going to be, you're going to have a chain put around your waist and then your hand, you're going to be handcuffed to the chain that's going around your waist. And then from there, there's also going to be another chain that's going down to, so to ankles uh, that, that's going to connect down to uh, ankle cuffs. cuffs that are, that are binding a chain between both legs. And then there's a box that's put on the handcuffs, this metal, this metal box, so that your cuffs are stiff. You, there's no, there's no give in them or anything like that. Your hands are, are stuck at your waist in this kind of, in, in this kind of a position, and your legs can't, your your body can't fully extend out or anything. Because the ankle cuff chain is about what, like twelve inches. So you have like twelve inches of movement between your feet. Yeah, it's 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 all designed to to really hamper your movement so you can't run when you when you stand you can't stand all the way up you have to hunch over and you know kind of inch your way along and all that and so uh, due to a lack of space in the in the back of the bus where the where the guys were all cuffed together they thought they were going to have to put me in the front of the bus with the with the uh, with the uh, protect with the uh, segregated inmates, but just so happened that they were wrong, they miscounted, blah blah blah. I just narrowly made it to the part of the bus where I got handcuffed to the population part of the bus, and the rest of the guys got moved into the front of the bus. So right as the bus got got took off, we hit the highway. It turns out that they had four guys on the bus that knew each other. 
And the reason why they were on this bus is because they had just gone to court. And one of them was a snitch that turned the other three guys in for some kind of plot to kill a guard. I, I'm not, I, had, I only heard rumors. I'm not really totally sure as to what happened. But all I know is that this one guy was telling on the other three guys, and they all three just got time behind this guy, and they put them all on the front of the bus together, thinking that because they had them handcuffed all like this, that they would be that the guy would be safe up there with them. So at the very front of the bus, they're 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 always these buses are designed with not for space, but for to maximize the number of people they can put on. So the front of the at the very front of the bus, you have two seats that are always facing each other. You have the you have one that's its back is against the is is it, the back of the seat is whoever sitting in there would have his back you know to the uh, front of the bus and then the other people on the other side of it. So they put that they put the inmate that was the one that was the snitch up there in that seat so that he would be right by the door so that if they needed to they could they could get to him really quickly. But when they get on the highway. They'll never open the, the the guards will never open the door that leads into that cage on the bus while you're in motion on the highway because that door immediately you know is is right on the other side of that door or the controls to the to the to the bus or the, the steering wheel you know the driver's seat and all that so they're not going to allow you access to this bus while it's in motion because you can wreck the bus and they're trying to you know or try to commandeer the bus or anything like that. These guys know that, so whenever they get on the highway and they know that they're safe from anybody trying to interfere in anything they're going to do on the do on the bus, so one of them sits down in the seat right next to the guy. Like imagine I'm sitting down, and, and to, this is this would be the snitch, and I would be the other guy. One of them sits down in this seat right here, right next to this guy, and the other one sits in the seat that's directly across from him, facing him. And then another one actually stands up. He's standing there, like in the aisle, right, right, hovering over all of them. And so they start attacking this other inmate. The one that's sitting in the seat next to him is using his elbows, like this, just smashing into this guy. The other guy that's sitting in the seat across from him is using his feet, like you know, to like. Donkey kicking this guy, just kicking this guy in the face. And the other one standing over him, using the chain and the box on the handcuffs to crack this guy in the head, in the skull, over and over again. So then you've got this guy a bloody mess. He's screaming, they're going to kill me, they're going to kill me, someone get me out of here. But they can't do anything because they're on the highway. And so they're, and these guys just keep on going to work on this dude for just untold. Uh, minutes go by. They threat. They they eventually pull the bus over onto a onto a dirt road. And they start threatening that they're gonna that they're gonna gas the bus. And whenever they th- whenever they pull over and they threaten they're gonna gas the bus, these guys they all sit down and they start acting like okay we're we're perfect game just we're not gonna do anything else. This guy is a bloody wreck by the way. The dude sitting here is just gashed up. There's blood all over the expanded metal and the, and the, and the plexiglass and everything that's behind him. It was I mean just blood was everywhere. And they would take off on the highway and as soon as they got to the highway these guys would do it again they would go right back to what they were doing to the point where they finally after three times three sessions of this on the highway this guy couldn't even respond he was completely unconscious and he's just a, a just limp in his seat and unable to even even fight back you got to imagine he's got his hands are to the point where he can't even put his hands up to defend himself he's He's in a position where he's just got to sit there and eat these blows. I mean, he's, he can't do anything about it. One way or the other, he's getting, you know, and, and it just got to the point where he couldn't even fight back. I mean, he couldn't even, you know, uh, resist the little that he could anymore because he was unconscious. And they were, they were pounding him. They were in, in, in an attempt to try to kill him. They were just going to continue to bludgeon him until he was dead. So they... Uh, the, we noticed. We all noticed that we're in the room. We're all sitting in the back of the bus, watching this whole thing go down. And like I said, I was one of the last people that got put on the bus, so I was sitting right next to that cage where all this was going down. So I got, a, I got a, I got a front row seat to the whole entire uh, the, the thing. I saw it all. It was, it was a gory mess. 
But the bus started speeding up really fast, and we started zipping. We got off the highway. We started zipping through uh, dirt roads and all that, and, and no one knew where we were going until all of a sudden, out of the blue, we all noticed that the Ferguson unit was coming up on the horizon. And these, and they pulled into the Sally Port there at the Ferguson unit, and there was 30 guards that were standing there in, the, in this little – a Sally Port, by the way, is – there's the, a, a – Whenever you pull into a unit, there's you're going to pull into an area where there's a there's a go through a gate. The gate shuts, and you're in between one gate and another gate. And this is oftentimes where the inmates will get off the bus and they'll and they'll they'll or they'll, or they'll do some searches or whatever. You know that type of thing before you get on a bus. So these guards were all just thirty of them, and they're all taking their name tags off their shirts. And we knew we were in for it whenever we saw that. And they went on that bus. They all had rubber gloves on their hands, and they walked in there and started grabbing these inmates by their chain. Everybody. There was only, by the way, there was only four inmates that were involved in this. One was a victim and then three of them. And there's a number of other inmates. There's probably maybe uh, 15 inmates all together that are up front. And only four of them were the problem. But they didn't care who was who was involved and who wasn't involved. Everybody was involved as far as they were concerned. They walked on that bus and started snatching everybody up by their chains, dragging them off the bus by their chains, throwing them down the stairs of the bus onto the ground. Be They then proceeded to kick the shit out of them while they were on the ground, all of them, stomping them, kicking them, stomping them, kicking them, then re-chained them all back up. And the next time that they chained them up, they were all chained with their hands were chained all the way down. Their feet were chained all the way up to here, and their hands were chained down to their feet. Then they picked them up by their chains again and drug them back on the bus by their chains, putting them in their seats and told each one of them, as they put they, they beat them into their seats, by the way. They were like, they had this one guy, oh, this one massive sergeant. I remember he was a seg sergeant. And he was just kneeing and elbowing and kneeing these guys into the, all the way up to the wall of the, where they Set them down on the seat all the way up to the window. I told him, "Look out the window and don't look. The, don't look back this way." And, and he was waiting on him because he knows that the, that the instinct is to find out. Well, you know, is to look back. And as soon as they did, pow! He was going to give him with a, a, I mean, a massive backhand slap with that rubber glove on. It sounds like thunder inside that inside that bus, by the way. And everybody got that treatment. One by one, they all got that treatment. And it was a mess before we go with it. It, it. They beat the hell out of every last one of those guys in the front of the bus. And that's my story about transportation and TDC. And I guess we shall say that's a wrap. I'm David. This is Malone. That's me. We can't see Ryan, nor can we hear him. The Shakedown was produced in luxurious Longmont, Colorado. Envato Elements provided our theme song, Shakedown. If you want to support us, you can find Shakedown shirts, hoodies, and more at waywardpress.com. That's W-A-Y-W-O-R-D press.com. If you have ideas for future episodes or cool stuff you want to see us make, let us know in the comments on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram at at Get the Shakedown. <laughs>